and I was a technical advisor. And then he assigned me actors to work with, like Cuba Gooding Jr., who I took down to the Super Bowl in uh, Phoenix and made him pretend he was my client for a week. Welcome to Story and Craft. Now, here's your host, Mark Preston. All right, here we are back. Another episode of Story and Craft. I'm Mark Preston, and yes, it's been a minute, hasn't it? Uh, been a little while, uh, kind of in solidarity with the SAG after strike. Uh, took a little break, a little hiatus, as it were. Uh, of course, a lot of our guests that we usually have on uh, not able to do the podcast thing uh, because of the strike. So uh, I took a little break, and uh, I can't I can't begin to tell you, by the way, uh, how much I appreciate. I've gotten some notes, emails, emails through our website, storyandcraftpod.com. I appreciate it greatly. I can't thank you enough. So thank you, thank you. Uh, today's episode, Lee Steinberg, legendary sports agent. He's represented and currently represents some of the biggest in the literal and figurative game. A uh, really inspirational guy, very very talented. Uh, just really enjoyed this chat. If you remember the movie Jerry Maguire, uh, it's not really about him, but there's a lot of him, uh, a lot of his input in that movie. And, uh, you know, just generally just a real mensch. Just a cool guy. Uh, now, I mentioned it before, storyandcraftpod.com, the website. Don't forget, jump in there. Uh, check out all the socials. Send me a message through the uh, little messaging doohickey on there. Uh, or you can send me an email. Um, and again, I do appreciate it. I appreciate everyone who has reached out uh, to check in and find out when the show is going to be back on. Well, here it is. We're back. And uh, let's jump right into it. Today is Lee Steinberg Day, right here on Story and Craft. Hello. How are you doing today, sir? I am good. Uh, thank you again for taking time out to chat. I was speaking with my son, who's my uh, my 18-year-old college kid, uh, who is uh, my resident sports guy. Yeah, I'm not as big of a sports guy as he is, so he he was like, you're speaking of Lee Steinberg, so he's like, to, to prep, he's like, we got to watch Jerry Maguire. So <laughs> we, did, we did that last night, so... Um, but uh, but how are things uh, how are things going for you? Anything anything new and exciting you're working on right now? Uh, anything in particular? We have a project um, to respond to the fact that athletic contests come down in the fourth quarter and a lot of them the last drive. So the question is, could you peak performance and productivity up in those critical moments? And so. I explored some modality to do that. And then secondarily, can you recover an injured athlete quicker? Um, because the cap system means that if you lose a starting player's backup is appreciably worse. So it's hyperbaric oxygen. It's blue, red, and white light stimulation. It's, it's Nano-V, which is cooked up... Uh, uh, air you breathe. Um, they all do the same th thing. Um, it's uh, wh which is they're anti-inflammatory. They peak energy. They they hyperbaric can make you live longer. So I've taken that to a number of different pro teams to try to get them to adopt it, and also cognitively um, uh, have found some new ways through neuroplasticity to to stimulate the brain so that someone who gets a concussion or a TBI. Um, the conceit's always been that it only gets worse, it never gets better, but now we have processes like RTMS and Nestry brain training that, that can sharpen up a brain so there are benefit in sports and there are benefit to anybody over 40. Um, so that's one. Second of all, we're working on a school that would be for high school athletes, but would also be for anybody interested in being working for a team, a league, a front office, marketing, branding, media, um, and that, that's in Arizona. Uh, I've got an agent academy coming up in a couple weeks where we teach the young people how to uh, recruit, negotiate, brand, market, 
set up a charitable foundation and the rest of that. Yeah, and just kind of looking over some of your information above and beyond what I already knew, it seems like you, you don't slow down. <laughs> you, you seem to be involved in quite a bit of, uh, you know, it would be a philanthropy or, you know, c- coming like what we were just discussing right now, which, of course, is beneficial for the players, but there is a cost benefit analysis kind of situation for the, for the owners and getting getting the players back and active. Well, once we validate these concepts in sports, then it takes you out to the larger uh, community. In other words, that it takes you out to Mark Preston, who says, I want to be cognitively more fit. I want to uh, uh, live longer. And so there's a revolution taking place in biomed that is going to alter forever the way we see medicine. It's funny. Uh, I remember, it's going back over 20 plus years ago, I was smoking and I was stopping smoking and I'd gone, there's a hypnotherapist and it actually worked. It worked really uh, fantastically, but he was implementing something where they had, um, uh, like these, we'll call them like goggles where, where uh, but they had different lights, led lights that would blink. And he said, this is based off some kind of a Russian study they did where if you med- merge this with a sound and it somehow does something. Well, see, and, and they have those treatments, um, which they have the light going on, they have the earphones on, and Russia, Germany, all those countries are far ahead of us in terms of understanding how the brain works and, and uh, innovative ways to, to uh, stimulate uh, longevity, lifestyle, everything. For your own, let's say, career longevity, would it be a stretch to say you kind of seem to stay kind of curious about different things that are going on and evolution of, you know, sports? And you don't seem like somebody that would rest on their laurels by any stretch of the imagination. It seems like you're constantly active. I think life is a constant learning process. And um, it's, um, it's uh, trying to know more, visualize where economics are going, where the culture is going, where the effects of, um, of climate change on, on our life. It's the ability to envision where the economy, entertainment, sports, politics, science are all going. It, d- it definitely seems like the lines are, for lack of a better way of putting it, the lines are kind of blurred uh, now, you know, it seems, but everything's merging together, you know, it seems like with entertainment and uh, just technology and just even being able to connect with you here, you know, that a few years back, that just would have been an, kind of improbable, you know, to do that effectively. Um, but it, it, one of the things I was curious about, uh, kind of hitting rewind on your origin story, as it were, uh, you're actually an L.A. kid. You, you're you from the L.A. area, correct? So I grew up in um, Los Angeles, <clears throat> went to UCLA for a year, and then it was the late 1960s, and it was all happening in Berkeley. And it was uh, societal norms changing, and long hair, and tie-dye, and external substances, and rock music, and anti-Vietnam. And uh, <clears throat> so, it, you know, part of me is, uh, is Southern California, uh, let's hit the beach. <laughs> the other part is, is, <clears throat> is Berkeley political consciousness and uh, desire to make a difference. And my father raised me with two core values. One was treasure relationships, especially family. And the second was try to heal pain and make a positive impact in the world. And the corollary to that was that when you're waiting for someone to make a change, someone to right a wrong, someone to, to take care of something as minor as picking a piece of trash up or as major as racism or climate change, you say your tendency is to wait for the amorphous they or them to solve the problem. Older people, political figures, um, uh, and my dad would look at me and say, son, you could wait forever. The they is you. You are the they. 
So it embodies uh, a sense of responsibility for everything around us. Now, now, where where was your father or where was your family originally from? Were they Southern California as well? Yes. Um, so they were Southern California. Um, my father was a teacher. My grandfather ran a place called Hillcrest Country Club, which was the hangout for um, a lot of the Hollywood crowd. And so I grew up... Uh, sitting at a table with Groucho Marx, Jack Benny, George Burns, um, George Jessel, Danny Kay <clears throat> at Hillcrest. And we have a great picture of me on Marilyn Monroe's lap. But my father turned away from all of that and wanted to educate people. And his philosophy was that he was here to, to uh, make a positive difference in the world help people who couldn't help themselves. And so he was head of the City Human Relations Commission, which had all the different racial and ethnic groups. And uh, so we had it hard driven into our heads, uh, you know, that um, money was fine and important at a certain level, but what was really important is uh, what did you do to try to ease pain for other people? Where are your uh, people originally from before they got to, uh, before they found their way to Southern California, where did they come from? Um, Central Europe. Um, and uh, I think on my father's uh, side from Germany and my uh, mother's side from Russia. And, um, um, but they came in the late 1800s and uh, my grandfather started out in New York. He had the biggest um, restaurant that was um, existed in the country. FDR used to have his dinners there. Um, but he gradually came out to Los Angeles and, uh, uh, and, and my mom's family came to Los Angeles. So we've been here forever <laughs> we're uh, yeah, it's yeah it sounds like i know my family didn't get here from ukraine until like 19, uh, 1907 something like that but it's funny my grandparents actually met my grandmother was from denver but my my grandfather they came through uh they immigrated through galveston texas they you know so we're texas jews through and through um go. but they met at the old uh, bullocks on wilshire my grandmother worked at the which is now i think an uh, extension of the law school i think i think out there but it is it's so funny because we've always had a connection to that uh, neck of the woods, but when, when you were mentioning what your father brought uh, to the table, it reminds me, now we're not really that, that religious at all, but one of the core principles, I was speaking with somebody the other day who's very much a Reformed Jew like me, and one of the core things that's interesting about kind of the faith is that thing, you got to leave the world better than you found it, kind of general principle, and it sounds kind of like that sort of that thing that your father was giving you. Well, it is, it is Jewish values, which is appreciating the concept of a strong family, education as a tool, um, and then making a positive difference in the world. So you had that as, as a foundation, but what <clears throat> what kind of propelled you into deciding, okay, I want to go, uh, or what, was there even a plan when you went off to college? Like, this is this is where my target is right now, or were you kind of exploring? I had grown up on old lawyer TV shows like Perry Mason and Judd for the Defense and the Defenders. And um, so I saw myself either being a political leader in, in some way, because uh, I ended up being student body president of all the different schools I was in, or uh, being a courtroom lawyer. And um, uh, there was no sports agency at the time I was going to school, <clears throat> so I sort of fell into it because I was a counselor in an undergrad dorm at Berkeley working my way through law school, and they moved the freshman football team into the dorm, and one of the students um, was Steve Bartkowski, who ended up the very first player picked <clears throat> in the first round of the 1975 NFL draft. And um, he asked me to represent him. And I was either going to take a job with the Alameda County DA or I had an offer in television news. But um, uh, 
we got the largest rookie contract in NFL history, and and I saw then that the athletes were the movie stars and celebrities in different towns across the country, and it made me think that um, I could take if I'd have an athlete retrace their roots and go back to the high school community that helped um, shape them and set up a scholarship fund or work with a Boys and Girls Club or work with um, a church that they could put down roots and make a positive difference and then at the collegiate level go back to that university community and do what uh, Troy Aikman did, which is to endow a full scholarship <clears throat> at the school. And then finally get the leading political figures, business leaders, and community leaders on a charitable board and do a charitable foundation to attack some primary problem that bothered the athlete. So I thought, well, I could actually achieve some of the same results this way. I would have a teaching counseling function with young men, hopefully stimulate the best in them, lead them towards second career. But more profoundly, that we could take on bullying and sex trafficking and domestic violence and, and racism and the environment by positioning sports and using the power of role modeling to impact um, uh, imitative behavior. Yeah, I think the argument has been made that it's not their, well, put them under the umbrella of celebrity. You know, it's not their responsibility, if you will. But I think with, you know, with that kind of uh, platform and to be able to have the access to be able to do something like that, I think it's incumbent upon folks to, to, to take the assets that they are that they're given and, and do something I, I it's really funny if i if i was to hit rewind and you mentioned troy aikman me being a dallas kid uh i remember that handful that that pocket of time when michael irvin and and, and uh, emmett smith and all those guys were coming on board uh with, with the cowboys it seems to me and I, correct me if you if you think i'm if I'm a little off but it wasn't until to me like late 80s early 90s that you really started hearing about these these big contracts you know I, I was watching Nolan Ryan's documentary the other day and I'm a big Nolan Ryan fan and he's talking about after he won the World Series with the uh, the Mets he came home and worked on a cattle ranch you know they made okay money but nothing really out there what do you think facilitated the the kind of the boom when athletes were really getting a big much bigger piece of the pie so television morphed from three basic networks to dozens and hundreds of competitive networks and they were all looking for ways to attract attention and uh, sports delivers an audience so the rights fees blew off the uh, charts um, and when I started each team in the NFL received two million dollars per season for its television national TV rights. And then the next contract they got Fox into the bidding and TNT <clears throat> and then ESPN. And the play was to show promos on Sunday afternoons that would promote the Monday through Friday primetime uh, uh, lineup and then increase the value of the network and so Fox used that and it went from two million dollars to 17 million when they got into the bidding per team per season and then uh, the next contract was 42 million dollars last year it, for NFL teams it was 200 million dollars and they just signed a new 10-year contract which eventually will lead to 350 million dollars per team per season just from national TV so this flood of television revenue then meshed with the building of brand new stadia with luxury boxes and premium seating and naming rights and, and all forms of ancillary revenue streams. And then we had fantasy sports enter the picture. And so, and now the internet had a revolutionary effect on sports. So you could watch them and stream them different ways. So the economics completely changed and uh, the television revenue alone was enough to explode contracts. Yeah, because it seems like the Cowboys, the old North Dallas 40 days, you know, these guys were, were not looking forward. They didn't have the kind of 
opportunity, less fiscal opportunity that, that the players that came after them uh, had. But the high school I went to in Dallas, it was um, a couple of uh, Tech Shrams grandkids went there. And it was really neat because Tony Dorsett's son went there. And so Cowboys are very much hardwired into kind of our, my high school experience. Um, but one of the interesting things was that uh, I think Tech Shram had been credited with uh, kind of helping to build the NFL into the entity that it is now. You know, and just kind of looking at football, of course, other sports as well. Did you have a preference uh, to, to stick with or to allocate most of your time to NFL players? Or did was there a preference at all? Or did you like to kind of split up your, uh, your attention to the different sports? So uh, on that Dallas Cowboy team you're talking about, I represented, I had the first pick in the draft in Aikman. And then in 91, the first pick in the draft was Russell Maryland, who was a client. And I had uh, Darren Woodson and, and Daryl Johnson and uh, <clears throat> sort of half that team. Um, I had done baseball since the very beginning, and we ended up with a practice that had about 60 players. Uh, Pudge Rodriguez, CC Spathia, Sean Green, um, Will Clark, Matt Williams, um, uh, uh, Manny Ramirez. Uh, so we had a big practice that way. And then in um, basketball, I represented about four lottery picks. And then boxing, Lennox Lewis, uh, the heavyweight champ, and Oscar De La Hoya. <clears throat> So no, it was all sports. Um, I don't know quite as much about hockey, but it was football, baseball, basketball, and then Olympic athletes who came back. Uh, the principles are all all the same, and the most important skill in any of this, Mark, is listening. It's being able to draw another human being out. It's being able to cut below the surface of surface responses to get to their deepest anxieties and fears and their greatest hopes and dreams, and get them to prioritize what values are most important to them. So if I can get that view of how they see the world. It's how important is short-term economic gain or long-term economic security or spiritual considerations or family or geographical or being a starter or being on a winning team. That constellation of values will fit differently into different people's lives. And it's my job to understand who they are below the surface, who they really are and where they live emotionally and to be able to fulfill them. Would it be fair to say that you took on more of a responsibility? Uh, let's say you take a 21, 22 year old, which I look at as a kid these days, and they become, I mean, overnight, they are just, they've got a lot of money for lack of a better way of putting it. And it could really put some different psychological, sociological strains on them uh, or family strains or, you know, whatever have you. Did you find yourself in the position of being kind of a counselor uh, or, or Sherpa kind of guiding them in some way to here's what you should expect? Absolutely. The parents did the hard work because to get a player to um, that point, you know, took a village. But I would build on the good values parents had, had instilled in their kids and try to, to stimulate them. But it, it's, it's taking an approach where you tell a young man or woman, you're going into a professional sport. And the real competition for the NFL is not labor versus management. It's competition for discretionary entertainment spending. So you're competing with the NBA and Major League Baseball and uh, Netflix and Home Box Office and Walt Disney World and every other form of discretionary entertainment spending. That means that you're trying to draw people to watch games on television, to buy merchandise, to physically attend games. And that gives you a special responsibility behaviorally on the field and off the field. And so you're going to live under a microscope. And so we need to think about how we don't have you out in a place consuming alcohol and then driving. We need to think about how 
we have you going into a place that serves alcohol and walking away from fights when somebody comes up and is obnoxious and and pushes you. We need to talk about your behavior towards women and the opposite sex. We need to talk about all these things. And if you don't want to aspire to a higher level of conduct, go play in a sandlot. But if you want all the riches and largesse that sports is going to afford you, you uh, can't be a camel with your head in the sand. You have to realize that you're on display every time you leave your physical house. Do you think that's your methodology or your, your perspective? Do you think that became or has become the norm? Or do you think that you're still a little bit of an outlier to kind of look at the full 360 degrees of the athlete's life. The very first day someone would walk into my office, Mark, I would ask them, what other talents and skills do you have besides athletic ones? How can we build towards a second career? How can you learn to network, go to a banquet, walk up to a a, a fellow there, have a five minute discussion, get his card and build yourself a group of what you and I used to call a Rolodex uh, of uh, friendships and people to help you. And it's it's how you, uh, Steve Young or Brent Jones both play for the 49ers. So you ask them, what businesses are there proximate to Santa Clara where you train that you might want to network in? Well, high tech and venture capital. So. Uh, it's not by chance that both Brent Jones and Steve Young had up hedge funds that are worth, you know, some billions of dollars. Um, um, well, I'd like Troy Eggman got into the, the automobile business pretty uh, heavily in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Right. So the premise was that was all branding, that if you had an elevated brand, would you rather drive a car and on your license plate it would say Troy Aikman Auto Mall, or Joe Schmo Mall. <laughs> and uh, um, so it was always laying that out. I wish that was the universal standard and representation, but probably the prevailing ethos is going to get the money. But relationships, that really is part and parcel of what your job was, is to foster those relationships uh, with with team owners or, or the, the people in the ecosystem that we're making decisions on drafting or, or trades or whatever have you. Um, was there a part of it that you enjoyed the most? I mean, did you enjoy the challenge or putting it together, you know, the deal as it were? Or did you, do, if you had a preference, do you, do you like the athlete, the relationship you had with them and the building of their career? Was there a preference between kind of the two different, two different camps of relationships, as it were. I mean, the real pleasure is watching and helping to be part of the maturation process of young men and taking them from being a college senior or junior to second career. Um, the most gratifying part of it was the charitable and community programs where our guys have been responsible for uh, major changes through the funding they can do. And, and I think in aggregate, our guys are over a billion dollars in terms of money's raised. But it's not just that, it's messaging. So when Lennox Lewis cut a PSA that said, real men don't hit women, it could do more to trigger behavioral change in rebellious adolescents who don't want to listen to any authority figures than than a thousand authority figures ever could, or Oscar DeLoy and Steve Young prejudices foul play. So that was the most rewarding part um, was the was the dual lanes of, of helping in the maturation of the young men, then together what we could do for the world. Yeah, it seems like it's a real pay it forward mentality that it, uh, naturally if they do that, then they're going to the decisions you've made as far as like how you, you know, try to influence them, then they take the ball, you know, no pun intended, and run with that. And then other people will do the same and hopefully exponentially that, that, and it seems like those kind of things do grow. Um, but it, it kind of brings me back to something, uh, I naturally got to bring up Jerry Maguire, but there, the whole, the, the preface of the movie was there, there was a change, there was a shift from moving away from that kind of what we're talking about right now. Um, 
did you have the opportunity to, to, to Cameron Crowe? Did you discuss? Did he come pick your brain and say, hey, you know, uh, before, while he was uh, conceiving of writing or whatever have you the movie? Did he ask you questions about your views on professional sports? And uh, w- w- were you involved in that process? Well, Cameron called me in 1993 and said he was doing a film based on a sports agent, and could he shadow me? and follow me and be in situations I was in with athletes and teams and games and the rest of it. So I said, sure. So he came with me to the league meetings in Palm Desert in 1993, where I was showing off free agents. He came with me to the draft in New York where I had the first pick. He came to press conference with Bill Parcells. He came to pro scouting day at USC he came to a series of games with me and all the time he was asking me for uh, insights and stories and I told him lots and lots of stories. And um, then he went off and wrote the script and I was a technical advisor so I had to vet the script to make sure the willing suspension of disbelief that keeps you in a movie that you um, that you didn't think it was phony, the dialogue was stilted, the look was not right, and all the rest of that. And then he assigned me actors to work with, like Cuba Gooding Jr., who I took down to the Super Bowl in uh, Phoenix and made him pretend he was my client for a week. And, um, so, yeah, there's a lot of life up there on the screen. Yeah, I mean, it does seem like there are, there are multiple... Uh, I don't want to say messages, but storylines kind of running through that, but using the backdrop of professional sports, uh, you know, and uh, the I, I'd seen somewhere, I'd read somewhere that uh, Warren Moon was sort of a quasi template for uh, uh, Cuba, Cuba Gooding Jr.'s character. Is, is that accurate or is that just urban myth? No, that's accurate. And Tim McDonald, who was a free agent, who we watched interact with teams and, you know, he. Cameron came out to dinner, like with Jim Irsay, the the uh, owner of Indianapolis. He he sometimes was a fly on the wall, and he sometimes I integrated him into the situation. And I sort of agreed with him. We wouldn't talk about what parts of my own life were. That obviously is not my life story because I started with the first pick in the draft. But um, that I you know would keep between he and I what particularly might have gotten modeled on what. Well, I know Tom Cruise is notorious for being, I'd say, one of those guys that's the most well-prepared. And he, both physically, knowledge, he probably knows everybody's lines, including his own. But uh, as technical advisor, was he picking your brain as well on just nuances? I, I worked with all the uh, actors. Um, in other words, Regina King, that was her first big role. And she, what would a wife think of watching her husband get knocked to the ground on the, and not get up? You know, what, what how would she relate? Or um, Jerry O'Connell, the quarterback who I showed how to throw a spiral because he had gone to NYU and they didn't have football there. Um, And um, uh, so it was working with a number of the actors on their role in the field. And they came down and they took my wardrobe and they shot like the scene before Jerry Maguire leaves the big agencies that shot out of my window in Newport Beach. Um, and they, they took my wardrobe and legal pads and descended uh, for feel and, and tone. That's the thing that I, I think you kind of inherently wanted to. I, mean, I remember being a young guy, I was in my early 20s, I think, when that came out. And I just remember sports was, was just, you know, that way you knew Michael Jordan was in the ecosystem. I mean, of course, the, talk about that 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 era of the Dallas Cowboys. It was just, maybe it was just because I was in my early 20s, I was more cognizant of that or something, but it seemed like there was a shift. It was becoming more, for lack of a better way of calling it, sports were becoming more Hollywood, if you will. You know, it was bigger personalities, the Deion Sanders types and whatever have you. Well, think about this. <clears throat> 80 of the top 100 Nielsen-rated TV shows last year were NFL football. 
So it means that NFL football is not only the most popular sport by two to one, it's the most popular form of televised entertainment. So that power went into raising the profile of individual athletes. And that combined with endorsements and the ubiquitous way that we saw Michael Jordan on TV over and over and over again. It gave athletes a chance if they performed dramatically and had good personalities to cross over from the narrow genre of hardcore sports fans to become household names. Well, how did you become cognizant of that? Of course, there was an evolution in, in sports as TV came in. Did you, were you noticing that, or are you just kind of a voracious, do you just digest all the information you can? No, no, we, we, we got to Atlanta, and we arrived at the airport the night before the signing, and there's cleat lights flashing in the sky, like for a movie premiere. A huge crowd is pressed up against the police line, and the first thing we hear is, uh, we interrupt the Johnny Carson show to bring you a special news bulletin. C. Bartkowski and his attorney have just arrived at the airport. I saw it. I saw it in a way I didn't in Southern or Northern California. I saw the, the frenzy. And I knew what an integral that, that these athletes were becoming the new movie stars. And so today, Patrick Mahomes wins the Super Bowl and he's on all sorts of other TV shows and everything and at the end of the day Time selects him as one of the hundred most influential people on the planet. <clears throat> so whether it was Tiger Woods or Michael Jordan or LeBron James or Muhammad Ali this celebrity building machine elevated these athletes to household name status. Well, what's interesting to me, and I, if you were to look in the kind of the overall, like the labor market is you know, outside of sports, you look at, you know, CEO salaries and, and uh, have skyrocketed and the proportionally your average worker salary hasn't really kind of kept up. But it seems like for those that kind of complain, oh, athletes shouldn't be making all this money and, you know, whatever have you. I kind of look at it like, well, it seems like that's an industry that's kind of kept pace. You know, you say there's massive TV contracts come in. Now the athletes get their fair share of that. It seems like in professional sports, they do get a reasonable percentage of the of the contribution they make. Do you, do you think that's an accurate statement that 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 well, they are? Remember, these these sports are capped, and they have formulas. So in football. Owners make 53% of the gross, of the money that comes in, and players make 47%. So the only way the player salaries rise is if revenue is rising. And they do a split, and they have caps that talk about how much rookies will be paid. And so there are limitations on spending. It can only grow to the point where um, you have revenue coming in at enhanced levels. And uh, now for the first time, you have football quarterbacks making the same money that their um, peers are making in basketball and baseball. I mean, what would you say to the people who, and this, this was, I'm going back to the 90s again, when I first started hearing this, people like, well, why are they making all this money? That's too much money. They're just playing a game. You know, I'm sure you've heard that argument many, many times. Well, you wouldn't think of it as quite a game if you saw what happens to football players over time. Um, in other words, their bodies break down, they have serious concussion issues, they have dementia issues, they've got all sorts of things. Their, their path in life, second career-wise, is not totally normal because of the amount of pounding that, that their body took. But the second thing is, it's all supply and demand. For years, I said to owners, I'll, we'll have a client take a cut in salary to the degree that that reflected lower ticket prices. And I would never take it up on it because ticket prices are a function of supply and demand. So for a football team, there's only 10 home gate, dates, right? And the people compete for how much they're willing to pay, whether it's a luxury box or just a regular seat. So it's what the market is, and it's value coming in um, every time 
someone buys a T-shirt or or uh, participates in fantasy or does and subscribe, it's there's so many different ways to enjoy sports now, and so it's um, um, it's all supply and demand. There's a finite amount of people who can play at these levels, and uh, and the sports generate it. I, I agree. I, I know the people that, that have over the years, so they shouldn't make that money. And to me, I've always been like, well, they should get their fair share of what their contrib- contribution is. You have uh, three kids, am I correct? I do. Um, I have two boys and a girl. Did any of them follow in your footsteps when it came to working in the uh, sports and entertainment industry? My daughter works in social media in Dallas. Um, my middle son works with me in the agency. And uh, unfortunately, the two boys have a, a eyesight condition called retinitis pigmentosa. So they're both legally blind. Um, but the focus has to be on what they still can do. And uh, the oldest one is teaching at a, a blind school. He's also a writer. Uh, the middle one aspires to be an agent. How old are your kids now? They are 37, 32, and 28. Yeah, I've got, I've got three also. I have to keep track of what they're... So remembering their ages can be a task. But uh, now, your daughter who lives in Dallas, what part of Dallas is she in? Uh, uptown. And, okay. Um, That's the happening area right now, of course. It's a, you walk down the street, and it's like um, young people's paradise. Yeah, well, Dallas is becoming to me like L.A. in a bit. It's it's just booming right now, you know. Very much so. And and if you're young, there are dozens of young people on the streets in the, in the cafes in the walk, you know, at the park. I mean, it's it's like uh, a whole generation of young people. Uh, starting their careers. I was a North Dallas kid. I grew up in the Burbs, but uh, yeah, I remember uh, my first uh, football banquet sophomore year. Uh, there was this young new guy for the Cowboys came to speak that they, because again, I text Shram, I think had a little pull, uh, but it was Michael Irvin showed up. And that was so, uh, so kind of interesting when I look at the career traje- trajectory. And that was his first year, young guy coming in. And uh, and when I worked at a, re- a restaurant, I served uh, Jimmy Jones, uh, uh, Jimmy Johnson, one time. You know, I thought that, I thought that was so cool. <laughs> Texas is probably, uh, maybe along with Florida, the most football crazy culture. One thing I like to do, I like I have something called my seven questions. It's just sort of like an additional get to know you, uh, something a little fun. Um, but one of the things I'm curious about, because I'm a, I'm all about the food, uh, so much so that when I'm in LA, a Jewish kid, I don't have any delis around me here, so I'm always at Cantor's at least two or three times. Um, but uh, curious about what your, uh, your, your, if you said a comfort food, something that you just love to sit down and it's a comfort food. What, what would that be? Your favorite thing. Mexican food, tacos, enchiladas, Italian food, pizza, lasagna, anything with red sauce and cheese uh, <laughs> it's the spot with me. But I also like Indian food and uh, Asian food and, and uh, um, I mostly eat a lot of green and a little bit of protein. Yeah, I need to do more of that. Uh, you know, it's uh, people always talk healthy, but in action, I, I need to. I, I talk it, but I need to do more of the uh, green. I'm so proud of myself. I put some greens on a taco last night. I felt it. I cooked. I felt like it's like, hey, I'm being healthy. There's a few leaves of something here. Um, <laughs> now, if you were to sit down uh, for a cup of coffee to sit down and talk story, uh, three people, uh, living uh, or not, uh, who do you think would make for a great few hours of conversation? You and uh, those. Who would those three people be? I think it'd be. Uh, Martin Luther King, um, Mahatma Gandhi, and maybe somebody like Denzel Washington. I think Denzel would be a great one. I mean, anybody there that's just, 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 they operate at the top of their game. He seems to have a great mental game. 
you know, I don't, for lack of a better way of putting it, those people really intrigue me. Uh, well, he, he and Russell Crowe are two actors to me who submerge themselves into a role and it's not necessarily them each time. In other words, I, I know Jimmy Fox and I remember watching him as, um, as Ray Charles. And he was in any given Sunday also, wasn't he? Yes, he, which I also was technical advisor for. And, and the point is, there's certain actors who, if you see Russell Crowe in Gladiator, it's not the Russell Crowe of a beautiful mind. It's not the Russell Crowe in um, uh, Les Mis. You know, it's, he, he inhabits the roles, and you forget who the actor is you're just into the role yeah as an actor I, I look at them and think they're just aliens i don't know how they do it uh another one is uh, uh leonardo dicaprio he's one of those guys that again kind of like i mentioned with uh tom cruise just so well prepared they show up on set and everything it's just all locked in to me it's like a it's like a player who it's game day you know and that when they blow the whistle they're ready you know um now if we were to if i was to say that you uh you and the family uh, y'all get to go hang out on an island, beautiful, amazing island, for a year, but you're not going to have streaming or internet or anything, so you're going to have to bring uh, with you a CD, your favorite album, and a DVD, a, a, a movie that you could watch over and over again. What would that album be, and what would that DVD be? Well, the album would be Motown, and uh, it would be the Supremes of Four Tops or, or a group. Uh, group from uh, back in my youth and the movie would um, you know as men we watch so many movies and if we like them we watch them over and over uh, The Godfather 1 and 2 3 I thought didn't work I would cut 1 and 2 chronologically so that actually the first part of the movie is is um, uh, Corleone growing up in Italy, and then trace it chronologically. Um, but The Godfather, the quality of those actors to have Marlon Brando and Robert De Niro and Al Pacino and Diane Keaton um, and all those amazing actors in one movie, and it speaks a lot to human nature. Yeah, I think, did um, you, have you seen the uh, Paramount Plus, The Offer? I think it's on Paramount Plus. The Offer, the movie about uh, the making of The Godfather. Oh, it, it was so good. It was so good. It was, uh, it, when you realize the obstacles they had, the the producer having to negotiate with the uh, Italian League, I think is what it was called. It was just, just getting the movie made. Um, and then the selection, because Pacino was not as big of an actor back then. But yeah, that, that, that I, I do believe there were some great actors in the third one, but I don't think the third one worked at nearly at the level the first two did. I, I will agree with you on that. The third one didn't work because somewhere between two and three, uh, Al Pacino morphed from a cold-blooded businessman uh, into an old uh, mensch, right? <laughs> And his voice wasn't even the same. He wasn't the same. That there was no character development that took you from this steely cold uh, uh, business person to this wonderful old grandpa. Well, as a kind of a side question, um, what movie about professional sports? Do you feel got it right? And I will say got it right for the time it came. I mean, it came out because, I mean, a, a movie came out in the 70s, most certainly. I don't know if it applies necessarily to this paradigm. Like, we're talking about just the money issue. Uh, what what movie do you think got it right in telling a story that seems and feels true to the life of professional athletes and just kind of the ecosystem of professional sports? Well, I hope Jerry Maguire did because um, <laughs> that was one of the films I was technical advisor on. I then did Any Given Sunday uh, with Oliver Stone and I did, then did a baseball movie called For the Love of the Game. Oh, that was and good. That was good. Coach. I was technical advisor, um, but you know the old Pride of the Yanks, some of those old movies. Every modestly themed, uh, modestly budgeted sport uh, movie based on aspirational 
uh, stories where someone hits challenge and crash and then has to come back and they all work um, and um, because it's uh, life will push us all back and the question is can you be resilient and those films all have that they have aspiration hope uh, reversals tragedy and then they come to a happy ending you know, I, I thought about you uh, when I was watching, um, this is a little while back, I think it was called Draft Day, Kevin Costner, I believe that's what it was called. It just just that seemed like I, I got fatigued just watching it going, man, there are a lot of moving parts in this industry, you know, to get, to get you know. Well, I, I thought they did a, a good job getting the pre-draft conflict over who you would take and how that would work and showing you how scouting introduced a player to a team and their assessment. And um, with all the millions of dollars they spend, they still make, uh, in scouting, they still make major mistakes. I can guarantee you that we just had an NFL draft. We're about to have an NBA draft. And if you go out three or four years, a third to 40% of the first rounders will either underperform or not make it at all. Now, they can't all be bad draft picks, so it's a strange process. It reminds me of uh, what is that, that, that film with uh, um, Clint Eastwood. He was a, he was a kind of a, on the back end of his career. Uh, a guy could go out and he, did, he was a scout for a professional baseball team. And he went out and he could see things maybe that... Oh, the baseball, the baseball movie with uh, his dog. Yeah, yeah. That was that was a good one. And, and, yeah. um, now, the, the next question I got for you, if you were to define from the time you get up until the evening when you go to sleep, what are the component parts for you for a, of a perfect day? So um, I do these treatments, hyperbaric oxygen, and I try to integrate uh, light stem and that. Um, I have a Fitbit and I try to walk 15,000 steps a day. Um, three or four times a week, I'll work out with a personal trainer. Um, so it's come in the office, but um, we've had a particularly overcast summer. Um, I love the beach, I love water. Um, you, my view here uh, is, uh, well, I'll show you. Oh, now you're just making me envious. <laughs> I, that is well, for, for those who are listening. You, you're you're right on the uh, little bay there, uh, little dock. Yes. See, I will I will All say right. this. I can work from anywhere doing what I'm doing. And I sat down to my third child, uh, Emma. She just graduated high school, and she's going to do a, a gap year. And I was like, where do I really want to be? You know, ultimately, do I want to move back to Texas, Southern California? I was like, I decided uh, there is a little island on the South Texas coast called South Padre. And I was like, you know, I'm just going to plant myself there. I know I'm going to be more, I'm at that age where i like, I know I need to be more active. And if I'm next to the beach, if I'm next to water, I'm going to be more active. I'm going to be outside more. So that's actually part of its... Uh, I find that I feel healthier when I'm near the water. So, so I could live in a ramshackle hovel as long as I had a view of the ocean. And when I lived more in the Bay Area, I looked out at the Golden Gate Bridge. And it could be a shack. It could be a tent. But if I can look at water, um, it, it makes everything go. And the other thing I'd add to... So then I have a day filled with talking to clients, talking to teams, talking to um, uh, doing all those different things. But um, one of the things I love is to read. And I actually have a book club on uh, Facebook that's got a bunch of members. And uh, But I always want to learn. I want to keep reading and learning and knowing about everything happening at it's part of how you get vision as to what the future is going to be. Well, the book club, I know you've written a few books. Are those in audiobook form as well? Um, the Winning with Integrity was my primer on the art of negotiating. It was the 12 essential rules of negotiating. Then in 2014, I wrote one called The Agent, which is an autobiography. And I'm currently... Uh, 
done the first draft of a third book, which will take me from that point in 2014 and then sort of the rebuilding of a practice and my struggle with uh, alcohol and, and a variety of, uh, uh, and then life lessons. Um, you know, there's th things I've learned and a lot of it's about resilience and coming back um, from, from adversity. Uh, live, live long enough, you really appreciate those aspects of life. You, know, you realize it's, you don't always, as you know, probably better than most, especially what working in the industry you do, athletes are literally top of their literal figurative game in life. And then that's only a, a snapshot of their entire life, you know? And so what do they do after? And, and that's, um, I will, I will be purchasing that book, but uh, I notice I can't really read as reading puts me to sleep because the time I do it, it's at night. I'm like, wake up with a book on my chest. So I've moved in the audiobook category more. And when I'm driving in the in my car, I'm usually listening to a book or a podcast. Um, but uh, last, the last two questions is if you weren't doing this, if this was not your vocation, uh, and there was some kind of universe where you would not be working in sports and entertainment, what would you be doing? Well, I'd probably be a writer. Um, I would, you know, I might write for a newspaper, I might cover sports, I might write politics. Um, I've done a couple radio shows um, as the host and podcasts as the host. Um, um, probably trying to push back climate change would be my top goal. The last question I've got for you, if, if we were to get that DeLorean like from Back to the Future and you're gonna go back in time. You had a, you know, a couple minutes with you as a 16 year old. What piece of advice would you pass along either to make uh, your path uh, or that moment in your life somehow better or maybe put you on a different track, a little bit different track? What would your advice be to 16 year old uh, you? Since I struggled with, with uh, alcohol and I'm now 13 years sober, I think I would tell that young person that you can handle any problem in life, death, sickness, uh, challenge, um, and you don't need to try to mask the pain with uh, substances. And to be careful because I didn't drink my whole life, it came later in life, and you have to, um, um, you can get, you don't have to have a genetic predisposition towards substance abuse. <laughs> You can just get there by by uh, uh, not dealing with problems frontally. When your book comes out, I think that'll be very informative to a lot of folks. Um, but again, I, I really want to thank you. I know you you are obviously very active, and, and taking this time out with me means a lot, and I do appreciate it without a doubt. My pleasure. Thank you so much. You take care now. Okay, Mark. Take it easy. All right, there you go, Lee Steinberg. Enjoy this chat so much. Uh, it's really cool to speak to an actual bona fide legend and, uh, and, and master practitioner in any industry. And Lee Steinberg is, uh, when it comes to sports agenting, is the guy. You know, he is a, uh, a, a, just a, a, a great guy with a cool philanthropic attitude and uh, just so talented and uh, inspirational. Cool guy. And again, like I said at the beginning of the show, I am so happy to be back with you. Uh, it's been a long time, and I know it has, and I've got some great guests, uh, some uh, folks who uh, you know and know well, got some great movies and TV shows coming out. They're going to check in with us. Uh, that's coming up shortly, and, uh, and if all goes to plan, uh, we should be coming out with two episodes per week going forward. So if you, uh, you know, have missed Story and Craft, don't worry. I will keep your podcast app Plenty full with great conversations. Uh, so that's it for today. Don't forget storyandcraftpod.com. Once again, storyandcraftpod.com. That's how you find out where to find the show on social media, as well as how to send me a message. Send me a note. Let me know what's going on. Let me know what episode is your favorite. And, uh, you know, I'm going to go grab myself a bite to eat. As you know, at the end of the show, I, I'm always hungry. That's the, just the way it is. So I'm going to run. You go have a great rest of your week or weekend or whenever you're listening. And uh, come on back. We'll be back with another episode shortly right here on Story and Craft. See you soon. That's it for this episode of Story and Craft. Join Mark next week for more conversation right here on Story and Craft. 
Story and Craft is a presentation of Mark Preston Productions, LLC. Executive producer is Mark Preston. Associate producer is Zachary Holden. Please rate and review Story and Craft on Apple Podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. You can subscribe to show updates and stay in the know. Just head to storyandcraftpod.com and sign up for the newsletter. I'm Emma Dillon. See you next time. And remember, keep telling your story. Come on.